Good afternoon, everyone. I'm uh, really honored to see so many of you here, particularly on this uh, relatively cold California day. Uh, you could tell I've been in California way too long because <laughs> uh, I am freezing, so I don't know about you. But <laughs> uh, anyway, thank you all for coming to this very exciting event. And uh, before we get started, I just want to acknowledge the uh, wonderful folks uh, in the Dean's office for helping put this together. So uh, let's uh, give them a round of applause because, <clears throat> you know, w without them, um, uh, this simply would uh, not happen. And so as many of you know, this lecture series really started as the school biologicals efforts to educate the uh, uh, public about very important issues that we face in regards to uh, life sciences. And I think many of you uh, heard me mention before that our foundational theme in the schools related to these three words, mind, body, world, because for most of us to have a healthy mind, we need to have a healthy body. And to have a healthy body, we really need to have a healthy world because all life is uh, interconnected. So in that spirit, you know, it's always great to put on these uh, really exciting uh, topics. And today's topic is focused on body. As a matter of fact, uh, you could even see it in the title here. It's entitled uh, Body on a Chip, the New Frontier in Drug Discovery. And I think and I hope that you'll find this lecture very exciting, uh, in part because we have a lot of experience in the biological sciences and we know that there have been many, many failures in drug development. And there are some issues with animal models and cell culture models. And so today's lecture is really focused on trying to overcome some of those uh, challenges. And I think and I hope you will see and appreciate the efforts that go into research to really take a drug all the way from the lab to uh, bedside, ultimately, uh, so that we can make a difference and con conquer all human disease. So today's speaker, uh, as is up here, is uh, Chris Hughes. He is the uh, current chair of the Department of Molecular Biology and Biochemistry. He has been on the faculty here since 1996, has had a lot of uh, honors and awards, including been elected as a fellow of the American, uh, American Association for the Advancement of uh, Science. Uh, he has uh, published uh, a breathtaking number of uh, peer-reviewed uh, research articles and uh, has a wonderful British accent. So with that, uh, let's uh, welcome uh, Professor Hughes. So uh, thank you, uh, Frank and the school, for inviting me to uh, give this talk today. Um, I have to put this up, so I'll let you read that while I get myself straight here. And uh, I think we're ready. So, all right, this is actually a, a quote from Groucho Marx. I want to live forever or die trying. And I think we all feel that way. We'd like to live forever, um, but we don't want to be sick. We want to be healthy. And so many of us, probably everyone in this room, some point in their life has taken medicines. Um, and they help us to live healthier lives in many ways. So what is important about medication? Well, two things, basically. Efficacy, does it work? So you take a pill, you want it to do what it's supposed to do. And then toxicity, does it have side effects? Now, it turns out that uh, toxicity is a, a limiting problem with a lot of drugs. And the father of toxicity studies uh, is this guy with the wonderful name of Theophrastus Philippus Aurelius Bombastus von Hohenheim. Um, nobody has names like that anymore. And uh, he is famous for this quote. I do not speak German, and so I'm not even going to try. But generally in English, uh, we render it as this. The dose makes the poison. And so his point was, that anything is poisonous if you have too much of it. It's the dose that matters. And so here's this poor guy. Uh, he's suffering a dosing problem. He doesn't have enough water. 
but too much water is also a problem. So even the dose of water matters. So everything has side effects if you get the dose wrong. So it turns out all drugs have side effects, right? So here's some you know, aspirin, probably the most successful drug ever marketed. It's an anti-inflammatory, but it can cause stomach ulcers. Uh, soma, if you've got a tight muscle, your doctor might give you soma, it relaxes the muscles, um, but it causes drowsiness. Uh, Shantix, uh, helps people stop smoking. Apparently you get overly vivid dreams with it. And Benadryl, uh, we've all taken this at some point maybe for allergies, um, it makes you just horribly sleepy. So those are side effects that are bad. Some drugs turn out to have some good side effects. So minoxidil, for example, was originally marketed for high blood pressure. Uh, it turned out it regrows hair. So that's a nice side effect. And then Rivatio was originally marketed to treat pulmonary arterial hypertension. It turned out to have some interesting side effects, got rebranded and remarketed as Viagra. So how do we find drugs that are both safe and do what they're supposed to do? So have good efficacy, low toxicity. It's not easy. This is a hard problem. Now, you've probably all seen this before. It's Moore's Law, right? This tells you how computer chips have developed over the years. Basically, Moore's Law says that the density of transistors on a chip will double every 18 months, and that's been true since 1970. Here's an early a desktop calculator, had this chip in it, had about 100 processors. Uh, if you've got an iPad, a new iPad, it's got this chip in, it has over 10 billion processors in it. So here's a, a good example of how things can get better over time. Drug discovery, Moore's law backwards is Erum's law. <laughs> and Erum's law is, talks about how many drugs you can develop for a billion dollars. So if you adjust all the figures, back in 1950, you could get maybe 50 drugs developed and marketed for a cost of about a billion dollars. We're now down below one drug per billion dollars. And to develop a drug now has been estimated to cost up to $2.5 billion. That's a lot of money. So what goes into drug discovery? How does it get so expensive? So the initial phase of drug discovery, we screen thousands upon thousands of compounds looking for some activity that we're interested in. We call this target validation, uh, target identification, target validation. And this can take three to five years. Uh, we then, this thing, hey. All right, uh, preclinical phase, we reduced about 250 compounds. Here we do toxicity testing, so make sure it doesn't have any overt toxicity. Uh, this can take one to two years. The next phase, the clinical trials. We go through phase one, two, and three. It can take seven, eight years sometimes. And again, we're reducing the number of compounds that we're testing. We're looking to see, do they work? Is there any toxicity we should be worried about? And then finally, you hope to have one compound at the end of this that you convince the FDA is something that should be marketed and given to patients, and that's another one to two years. So it's a long process. And of course, over this time period, the accumulated costs increase. And so by the time you get FDA approval, you're up to a couple of billion dollars. Now, here's one of the issues. Only one in seven drugs that enter clinical trials is successful, and hundreds of drugs that you test before that are not successful. But that one drug that goes to market has got to pay for all the failures. So that one drug is now paying for the seven that failed in clinical trials, sometimes it's more, uh, and all, all the research that went on before that. And so the mantra that's been developed in the pharmaceutical industry is this, fail early, fail cheap. The quicker you can decide a drug is not going to be working for you or might have toxicity or might fail in a trial, the earlier you can discover that, the more money you save. You're not going to be pouring money into a bad drug. So then we have to ask, well, 
why is the success rate for drug approvals so low? Why, why are we not very good at doing this? Well, one answer, um, low-hanging fruit. All the easy drugs have been found already. Now we're just trying to find the hard ones, drugs that are for diseases that are difficult to treat. So that, that's one explanation. Um, the FDA has certainly become more stringent over the years. Um, lawsuits is always a concern for the pharmaceutical companies. But the part of it that we think is really important and the part that we feel that we might be able to fix is this. Gigo, you've heard it from computers, garbage in, garbage out. And this is true in drug screening as well. If you start off with a bad drug and then you take it through trials, you're going to lose a lot of money. Much better to have something good to start with and increase your chance of success. So how do we discover new drugs and test them for both efficacy and toxicity? So here's us, human. That's all we're interested in. We're trying to cure human disease. And we each have about 200 different kinds of cells in our body. And you can think of some. There's neurons, uh, there's blood vessel cells, there are lymphocytes, that are your white blood cells, there are muscles, bone. Uh, so about 200 different kinds of cells. And this is kind of obvious, but it's always worth saying we are three-dimensional people. I turn around, three-dimensional. Okay, that's an important point. Because a lot of drug testing, we take one type of cell and then we put it into a Petri dish. You've all seen a, a Petri dish, right? So here's something interesting about a Petri dish. It's hard, right? It's really hard and stiff. Now I want to ask you to just grab your hand and sort of knead that bit around your thumb, right? It's, it's kind of soft and squidgy. Most of your body is, you know, kind of soft and squidgy. That's the way we are. And yet we put cells onto this really hard, flat, two-dimensional surface. And not surprisingly, cells in this environment don't behave the same way they do in this environment. And that's a problem, right? If you're looking for drugs that are going to work here, and you're testing them over here, there's an issue there. So if you haven't seen cells growing in a dish before, this is what they look like. Uh, so each of these is a little cell, and it's growing on a plastic dish. All right. So how do we validate new drugs? Well, again, we use the same assays. We grow cells, single type of cell at a time, in a 2D monolayer. Uh, there are some new techniques coming out where you can get the cells to form a ball. It's called a spheroid, so here is one. These tend to be just single cell types again, so you don't have the complexity of a real tissue. Um, and they are 3D, so that's, that's some improvement. And then side effects. How are we going to test the side effects? Well, we use this little chappy, the laboratory mouse. So here's the question, simple math, does this equal that? Now, to many scientists, the answer is, well, yes, of course, and that's why we use them. But there's some obvious differences that tend to be more obvious to lay people than scientists. For a start, um, I'm not a really big guy, but I'm about 2,500 times the size of an average mouse. So a mouse weighs about an ounce. I weigh 2,500 times that. And you can do the math to figure out how much I weigh. <laughs> <coughs> Lifespan. Um, laboratory mouse has a good life. Most of the time, we're not doing stuff with it. Uh, they can live for two years in the wild, maybe a year. Uh, there are people in this room live 30 times that. I'm looking around, there may be somebody who's lived 40 times that. So they live not very long. And that actually makes a difference. Cells change as they get older. And you don't model that well in a mouse. Heart rate, for example. If you want to test heart drugs, would you do it in a mouse? Well, you guys sitting here, most of your heart's beating right now hopefully, um, at about 72 beats per minute. That's the average. Um, if you're at the back, you've had a long day, you're kind of nodding off, it might go down to 60. If you had to rush to get here because of traffic, uh, your heart rate might have gone up to, say, 120 beats per minute. A resting mouse, the heart beats 300 beats per minute. I can't even go boobly, 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 boom that fast. That's how fast, 300 beats 
per minute. If you get a mouse excited, 800 beats per minute. It's vibrating. Now, is that a good model for the human heart? Not really. So, mouse, is it a good model? Not really. So, where does that leave us? So, we have poor models for drug discovery, we've got poor models for drug validation, and we have equally limited models for testing toxicity and any potential toxicities. So, what are we going to do about that? So, I'm going to do a little diversion here, we're going to have a little history lesson. And here is my lab in 1996 when I first started at UCI. Uh, believe it or not, yes, that is me before my <laughs> hair went gray. Uh, and these are the guys that helped me start the lab. And what we were working on back then are endothelial cells. And we'll hear a lot more about these later. These are the cells that line all of your blood vessels. And that's what we in the lab work on, endothelial cells. And we get those from the delivery suite at the hospital. So we go up there, we get umbilical cords snipped after the birth, we bring them back to the lab and we can get cells out from those cords. There's a big vessel runs right through it. We get the cells out and we grow them in a dish. So that's how we get our endothelial cells. Time moves on. We found a way to get these to stick to little plastic beads. And then we embedded these beads in a gel and the gel is actually just like a blood clot. That's what we use uh, in a dish. And then we could get little blood vessels to grow out. So here's one growing out. It's a tube. So the middle is hollow, and the outsides have got endothelial cells. And if this was in the body, that would be carrying blood. And you'll see more of these colorful pictures later. We have ways to label cells so that we can see them more clearly. And here, the green shows you the endothelial cells, the blue is the nucleus of the cell, and the red shows the junctions between each of the cells. So there's lots of different cells all aligned here to form this vessel. Again, time moves on, and we're back to our mouse. What we decided to do with a good colleague of mine, Steve George, is to ask, could we take these blood vessels and see if they actually work as real blood vessels? So we put them into a mouse, and what you're seeing here is a micrograph. Basically, these blue vessels are human vessels that we've grown in a dish. These red ones are the mouse vessels, and they hook up with each other. We call it anastomosis. And now we get mouse blood flowing through these human vessels in the mouse. So that was pretty cool. And we did some nice work on that. We showed that these, uh, the vessels that we can make in the lab will actually work if we put them into an animal. So we really do have a good model of blood vessels. So that was exciting. So here is Steve George, a good friend, colleague. And this is where we started vascularizing microorgans. This is the inception of body on a chip for us. And it's where a bioengineer, Steve, meets a vascular biologist, myself, and good things can happen. So we were chatting one day, and Steve said, so all this stuff we've been doing, it's, it's cool, I like it, we've been doing it for a while, yeah, i kind of bored. I was like, yeah, I know what you mean. He said, what would be a really cool thing that we could do? And I said, well, we're making blood vessels in a dish, but blood vessels carry blood. Wouldn't it be cool if we could have blood vessels in a dish and have blood flowing through them just as it does in the body? Wouldn't that be cool? So we had a good laugh, and then being an engineer, Steve's like, okay, but how would we do that? So we made a sketch, um, and basically what you're seeing here is three channels. Uh, there's two channels on the outside that we thought we could line those with the endothelial cells, and we could carry blood through there. And then we're gonna put a gel in the middle, just like that pink gel you saw in the other picture. And then we were going to try and persuade new blood vessels to grow between the two. And then we could run blood in here and out there. That was the idea. And we thought, okay, maybe we could do that. So we wrote a grant. Oh, first, Steve turned this into a much prettier drawing. And we wrote a grant to NIH and said, we think we can do this. They said, that's kind of cool, give it a shot. So we got this grant and we did it. And you'll see how we did it in a moment. But I've been talking a lot about blood vessels. 
and you know kind of what they are, right? They carry the blood around the body. But we need to know a little more about blood vessels before we carry on. So I'm going to do that way back music and take you back to school biology class, but don't worry, it's no pop quiz. All right, so we're going to talk a little about what blood vessels are and how they work, and then I'll show you how we made them. All right, this is what they're not. So people tend to think of the plumbing, right? You've got vessels, they carry blood around. It's just a bunch of plumbing. No, I'm a vascular biologist. I'm here to tell you vessels are much more interesting than that. They're living and they're dynamic. They can grow, they can constrict, they pump things out of the blood, they pump things back into the blood. They're very active. They're, it's an organ, in fact. It is an organ. So, blood vessels are interesting. So the history of blood vessels, this chap is Galen of Pergamon. Uh, he is the first person we know of that really thought about how blood vessels and the heart works. Maybe people before him, but they either didn't write it down or we lost it. So he's the guy. What he proposed was that the heart pumps blood from the heart through the vessels to the periphery, which it does. A um, couple of other points he got a little wrong. He thought the heart made the blood. And then he never really addressed where it was all going. It sort of got to the end and pff, just somehow disappeared. But that's fine. Maybe he wrote it down and we lost that page. All right. So what are we, 1,500 years later, uh, an English physician, William Harvey, um, he proposed that blood recirculates back to the heart. And he's right. So it goes out of the heart, goes around the body, back to the heart, and around it goes again. But he couldn't figure out how it was getting from the arteries that he could see to the veins that he could see. There was just nothing in between that he could see. But there was an invention sometime around 1650 that allowed Marcello Malpighi to figure out how they were joined. And that invention was the microscope. So he could now look at tissues and see there were actually really tiny vessels, which you couldn't see with the naked eye, which are connecting the arteries and veins. And those are called capillaries, or where you guys come from, capillaries. <laughs> Same thing. All right. So we could think of the vascular system as kind of like the highway system. Okay, so this familiarity is Southern California. And we've got the big roads, right? We've got the 405 and the 5. And we, sometimes the traffic reporters even talk about the major arteries into the city are blocked. And we well know the 405 and the 5 are often blocked. So if you're getting closer, you see branches off the 405. So here's the 73 coming down to where we are, down here somewhere. And then if you go in even closer, you get off the 73, and now there's smaller roads. Here's Benita Canyon, and then another road, and all these little roads. And these little roads are like the capillaries. And so now you can see the individual houses. Houses are like the cells of your body. So cells, they need nutrients. They make waste. Got to get rid of the waste, like your house. You get a delivery, comes in at LAX, gets on a truck, comes down the 405, 73, Benita Canyon Road, da da da, around the little streets to your house, delivers it to your house. Friday, you put the trash out, gets taken away. So the body is just the same. You've got blood vessels, uh, our system of roads, if you like. All right. Now, so here's all the blood vessels in your body, and they are different sizes, as we've talked about. The aorta comes off the top of the heart. That's your biggest. You can, if you want, stick your thumb down inside it. That's how big it is. Don't recommend it, but you can. So it's about three quarters of an inch in diameter. And then these capillaries, these smallest vessels, they are less than a tenth the diameter of the finest hair. So if you just pluck a hair and look at that, about one-tenth the diameter of that is these smallest vessels in your body. And they connect the arteries and the veins. And we drew, draw them red and blue because oxygenated blood is very red. And deoxygenated blood, after the, the, the vessels have given up the oxygen into your tissues, it goes more of a bluish color, 
goes around again. So the capillaries are here, so artery, vein, capillaries. Here again is a vessel, and these cells here that are lining it, those are the endothelial cells we talked about earlier. There's a couple of red blood cells inside. Those are the ones that are carrying the oxygen. And this should look familiar because that's what we created, right, in the lab. Again, here's the endothelial cells, and here the endothelial cells. And here's a nucleus, and the blue is the nucleus, and it's a tube. That's the defining feature of a blood vessel. It's a tube. So, going completely diverse now, I put this in because it's fun. Um, you've had your blood pressure taken, right? So it's always measured here, which is right at the heart. And if you're reasonably healthy, you've got a systolic pressure of about 120 millimeters of mercury. Now, because of gravity pulling us down, it pulls the fluid in our body down as well. So the pressure at your feet is actually higher, and the pressure at your head is lower. So if you do a headstand and you feel like your head's going to explode, that's why, because your head is now getting much higher pressure than it's used to. And this fine chap you'll recognize is a sauropod, a dinosaur, what we used to call a brontosaurus. And you can see it's using its super long neck to reach up to the trees there so it can get the, the leaves right at the top of this tree. Now the problem with that, if he wants to maintain 90 millimeters of mercury pressure in his head, and if he doesn't, he's going to pass out. If he wants to keep that pressure, the pressure in his heart is going to have to be 700 millimeters of mercury. Now, this is a big animal. And to generate that kind of pressure and pump it all the way up there, this chap's heart would have to weigh five tons. Now, dinosaurs were big, but they weren't that big. A five-ton heart is just not viable. And that's part of the reason we think that creatures like this didn't raise up to the trees. They actually were horizontal and were reaching out and feeding that way. So, interesting little fact, I think, anyway. So... Back to Steve. It's now 2011. So we've done all this cool work, and we've, we've managed to get these vessels working uh, in a dish. Um, and luckily enough, at the same time, DARPA and the NIH put out a call. They wanted people to do some work, and they were going to give grants for this work. And DARPA is the Defense Associated Research Projects Administration. So they fund all the crazy stuff. And you'll see what I mean in a moment. Um, so they wanted a body on a chip. They wanted a handheld device, something about the size fit in the palm of your hand, that would have 10 human organ systems all working together. And the idea was they could use this as a rapid test if the air is toxic or a chemical is toxic. They could put it into this body on a chip and see you know, does the liver blow up or do the lungs stop working? So super crazy idea, um, but we thought, what the heck? And Abe Lee joined in with us, and so we wrote a proposal for this. And tell you how crazy it is, uh, Barry Pilotta, who's running DARPA at the time, used to say this, if 90% of what we fund doesn't fail, we're not doing our job. So they didn't want to fund stuff that they knew was going to work. They wanted a fun stuff that probably wouldn't, but if it did, wow, wouldn't that be cool? So that's what we decided to do. And this is the way we think of things now. We can have simple assays, like cells growing 2D in a dish. Uh, it's not terribly physiologic. It doesn't tell us much about our bodies. This is where we want to be. It's physiologic, but clearly not simple. Clinical trials are very expensive to run. We've talked about the issues with mice, uh, spheroids, they're okay, but we wanted something that sort of hit the sweet spot between simple and complex, physiologic and not physiologic. And we created something we call the 3D VMO. It's a vascularized microorgan. And this is what we did. So you'll recognize this picture because you're all vascular biologists now. This is an artery in red and a vein in blue and these little vessels, the capillaries, that hook up. 
And it's at the level of the capillaries that oxygen is given up to tissues. That's where all the nutrients come out and feed the cells. That's where the waste from the cells goes back into the blood and back into the circulation. So we schematize it this way. So again, we've got a channel here is the artery, a channel here is the vein. This little diamond shape we call the tissue chamber. That's where we're going to put our organs. And then we've got a little vasculature that connects. And you can already see that's what this is. We've got an artery, we've got a vein, we've got a capillary network, and we've got some green cells in there, which are the tissue that we're interested in. So we can now take this, this little tissue chamber, and we can put it into this. This is what's called a 96 well plate. It has 96 little wells in it. You can see them here. And underneath this is where all the magic is. Uh, we have a layer of a sort of a rubbery silicon-like plastic. And within that, we create all the structures we want. These arteries and veins, these little tissue chamber, and then we grow the vessels in between. And that's what this is. And then we stick a glass slide on the bottom, we stick it all together, and that's what this is. This is 16 little organs on a chip. Why do we call it a chip? Everyone's interested in that. And the reason is that the features that we create in here are done by a process called photolithography, and that's the exact same process that makes computer chips, photolithography. And so we started calling these chips, and everyone calls them chips now, so that's why. So this device is what we're going to be talking about, and these tissue chambers are inside of here, and it's got blood vessels. All right, so the dimensions. They're about two millimeters long, about a millimeter across, because a millimeter is about the average length of a capillary bed. So we wanted to model what you see in the body. And these are the vascular networks that we create. These are living blood vessels, just like the ones I showed you before. But now they're connected to an artery and a vein, and they're little tubes. These cells have all been made to express a protein called GFP. So a lot of the pictures I'm going to show you from now on, you'll see that the cells are green or red or blue. It's because we've made them express these proteins which fluoresce. So it makes them easy to see. And uh, this protein originally came from jellyfish, which is kind of cool. And so here's one of these uh, junctions. This is the artery. You can see the endothelial cells that are lining that channel. And then as it comes around, these are the capillaries that are growing off. And you can see their tubes. So there's like, uh, we've got about one, two, three, four, maybe five coming off here. And the blue is the nuclei. And again, just as it whizzes by, you can see it's a tube. So these are the blood vessels. Now, could we get blood to flow through this? How would we do that? Well, we could put a pump or a little heart we felt that was a bit complicated, so we decided to do it a simpler way. And we used some basic physics. So pressure-driven flow, you've all heard of this before. Water finds its own level, right? So if you imagine there's a well here and it's got water in it, there's another well here that's got less water in it, and there's a very thin little line connecting them, then gravity will drive this fluid along here and into this chamber. And this difference in the height, delta H, is what we call the hydrostatic head. And that's what's going to drive fluid through our blood vessels. So it's just like a river. If you've got a, a fast-moving stream on a steep hillside, it's got a large hydrostatic head. A river out by the ocean goes very slowly. The drop is much lower. Same principle. So here's one of our vascular networks. We've made this one green. And we're running a red dye, a sort of blood substitute. And that's running in here, and it's coming through here, and then out the other side. So just like it would in a real system. Now we can put little fluorescent beads in, and we can make those run through. We can control the speed they flow by changing the hydrostatic head. And they're blood vessels, so we should put blood in, right? So we did try that. 
And this is what you're seeing here. So there's areas where the blood is moving slowly and areas where it's moving fast. And so we've got blood flowing through blood vessels in a dish. And if you're wondering, is this what it looks like for real? This is blood flowing through capillaries in the skin, actual body, an actual living creature. And you can see the red blood cells, they're coming on and it goes slow, slow here. And then you'll see it loop around and it goes fast again. So just like this. So we really have mimicked what you see in the body. I put this up because I think it's beautiful. <laughs> uh, and it also tells us something. So here's a, a, one of these blood vessels and there's a branch off here. And again, you see the red endothelial cells that, oops, <laughs> got this little arrow coming in here. You see the red endothelial cells that line it. And we've also made the surface. So the inner surface of the blood vessel is green. And again, we have the nuclei in blue. And then the outer surface of the blood vessel, all this wispy stuff in white. So that's the whole structure of a blood vessel right there in one picture. So now the question is, we've created these little mini organs in a device, in our chip. How can we use these to test drugs? That's what we really want to do, is use these to test drugs. And we're particularly interested in anti-cancer drugs. So here's one of our tissue chambers. And these green cells in here are colon tumor cells. So these come from a patient. They're grown in dishes, and then we put them in here. And they grow very nicely in this tissue chamber. And it's important to remember that the survival of these tumor cells is entirely dependent on delivery of nutrients through the blood vessels, just as it would be if this, as if this tumor was growing in a patient. And likewise, if we're going to deliver drugs, we're going to deliver them through the blood vessels, so they'll get to the tumor in the same way they would get to a patient's tumor. It's very rare that you can inject a drug straight into the tumor. You take a pill or you have an infusion, the drug goes around in the blood vessels, around the body, then it gets to the tumor, it's got to get out of the blood vessels, into the tumor so it can kill the tumor. That's what we want to model. And so here you can see this tumor in green, and the blood vessels in red, they're growing into and around this tumor, so it's getting lots of nutrients, so it's happy. So we took this colon tumor, and then we let it grow over time in the absence of drug, and you can see it gets bigger. And then we put in Folfox. If you're ever unfortunate enough to get colon cancer, you'll almost certainly be given Folfox. It's the standard of care for colon cancer. So we wanted to see, does it work? And you can see that the tumor, uh, it's slowed down and actually looks like it's decreased in growth. So here's the growth time along here and tumor growth, you can see this tumor is getting bigger over time without drug. But if we put in this drug, then we can slow and reverse the growth of this tumor. So the platform works for colon cancer. We next wanted to look triple negative breast cancer. It's the worst kind. It's a very aggressive tumor. And you can see it grows rapidly. You can see how it spreads through the tissue. We say it's an invasive tumor. Same thing you see in patients. And the standard of care there is something called Taxol. So we put in Taxol. And you can see, again, it's controlling the growth of this tumor. And plotted out, here's the growth without drug. And then with Taxol, it's not quite as effective as it was as the drugs we saw for the colon tumor, but it does work. We've tried multiple kinds of tumor in the device. So we've got triple negative breast cancer, other kinds of breast cancer, uh, three different types of colon cancer. Uh, this is a very aggressive brain cancer. Every tumor we've tried works here. So we've now got a platform where we can test different kinds of tumors against different kinds of drugs. So the question is, is the VMO, our vascularized microorgan, our platform, is it better than a plastic dish? So here's an example of why it is. This is a dose response curve. So what we're looking at along the bottom here is an increasing dose of a drug. And we're looking at how well the tumor survives. So at the beginning here with no drug, the tumor is 100% surviving. It's doing very well. 
If we look at this tumor growing in one of these plastic dishes, you can see the first dose of drug, it almost completely wipes out the tumor. And then more drug, and we pretty much kill off the tumor. If we put that same tumor in our device, at that initial dose, the drug's hardly effective at all. You need a lot more drug to kill this tumor. So why is that important? This drug works 10 times better in a plastic dish than it does in here. Now that's not a good thing. You might think, wow, this is a great drug. Look how effective it is. But as soon as you use that drug in a more complex environment, something that mimics what the body actually is, then you find the drug doesn't work so well. So, is it better? Yes, it is. It's much better at predicting drug responses in people than our, our old assays. So, the old plastic dish like this, not very good. This one, much better. So, we're happy about that. So, that's, that's what we can do for drug discovery. We've got better ways of testing drugs, finding out if they're going to work. So how about treating patients? Can we use this to help with the treatment of patients? So everyone is different, right? Everyone in this room is different. But if you get colon cancer, you're all getting the same treatment. That's the way it works. Now, is that ideal? Not really. You'd like medicine to be more personalized. Maybe some drugs work better in you than other people. Maybe your tumor responds to this drug, but not that drug. So we're now entering the age of personalized medicine. So here's our long-suffering person, and now they've got colon cancer. So what do we do? We are now taking tumors from patients. The physicians give us tumors, fresh tumors from patients, and we can break them up into little pieces. And these are little tumor spheroids, they're called. So we can make those in the lab. And then we put them into our device. And here, here's one of these little spheroids from a patient in our device and the blood vessels again. So it's quite happy in there. It's getting the nutrients it needs. And then that will start to grow. And here again, the vessels. Here's the tumor. That will start to grow in here because it's a tumor. We can then do drug testing on it. We can take 10, 20, 30 different kinds of drugs, test them all, on this tumor, find out which ones work, and then we can say to the physician, hey, we've tested all these drugs, don't bother with those, they're no good, but you might want to try these because they seem to work against this patient's tumor. So now you give those drugs to the patient and ideally you clear up their tumor. So this is the whole idea of personalized medicine. We've just started clinical studies on this. We're already getting the tumors. We're just starting the drug testing. We need to do a lot of work to see if it's successful. Can we actually predict which drugs are going to work? But ultimately, we hope to be able to complete this circle so that we can then help physicians choose the best drugs for their patients. So what other tissues can we make? So we've made tumors. Uh, we're interested in brain. Um, this is the vasculature in your brain. The brain is a very busy organ, needs a lot of energy, so it's got a lot of blood vessels in it. And the blood vessels in your brain are unique. They're different to the blood vessels in the rest of your body. Most of the vessels in your body are kind of leaky. Uh, the ones in the brain, much less so. The brain is such a delicate organ, you can't risk just anything getting out of the blood into the brain. So it's a very tight barrier. So we wanted to mimic that because that tight barrier also stops drugs getting in. And so there's all sorts of good drugs out there that would be great for treating neurologic conditions, but they don't get into the brain because they can't get out of the blood vessels. And the reason is this is the structure of these vessels. In green, we have the endothelial cells that we've learned about. And there's also these cells called, called astrocytes. And they put down what are called foot processes onto the vessel. And it's this interaction that makes this vessel special and makes it so tight. So we've recreated this in our device. So the green vessels, here you can see the astrocytes in red, and you can see them extending these processes and spreading out on the surface of the vessels. And 
We can also see it here as this rotates. Again, you can see these other cells. They're wrapping around the vessel just as they are here. These green ones are actually these yellow ones. And the red is the, the vessel. So again, we can create this structure. And it turns out we can mimic how tight those vessels are. We make very not leaky vessels. And we've now started to put neurons in. So the green are neurons, and the red are the vessels, the blue are the astrocytes. So we're creating little pieces of brain tissue in our device. We hope to use those, again, not only to understand brain function, but also to try and identify good drugs. The liver. So toxicity, drug toxicity, most of it actually happens in the liver. When drugs fail, probably seven times out of 10, it's because those drugs have caused damage to your liver. So we want to model the liver. This is kind of what your liver looks like. Uh, there's little lo lobes here, here's the blood vessels. And in here, this is where all the metabolism goes on. That's where you turn your stuff coming from the gut into useful nutrients. And uh, this is where drugs get metabolized as well. So we've redesigned our device, but it's similar. So we've got a hepatic portal vein. This is the blue one here. That's what brings nutrients from the gut to the liver. We've got the hepatic artery, this red one. That brings in oxygenated blood. Those mix, this is the liver tissue. And then everything goes out through the central vein, which is that. So we're trying to recreate the structure. And this is really, really new data, uh, but it looks like it's working. The red blood vessels are in there and the green are the liver cells. So that's cool. And liver cells express specific enzymes whose job it is to detoxify your blood. And so we wanted to see if these cells are expressing those. And in blue is non-liver, very little expression of these enzymes, but you can see our liver cells are expressing lots of these enzymes. So it looks like we've created a pretty good liver. So we're excited about that because we can now do toxicity studies. Finally, the model I want to talk about briefly is pancreas, diabetes. A lot of people suffer from diabetes. We're wondering, can we do something to help? So normally, when you eat, you get increased blood sugar, right? That's why you eat, get the increased blood sugar. That causes an increase in insulin, and then insulin causes the blood sugar to go down. That's what should happen. In diabetics, the problem is they eat, blood sugar goes up, but there's no insulin produced. In type 1 diabetics, there's no insulin, so the high blood sugar remains, and that's dangerous. So where does that insulin come from? Come from? It comes from the pancreas. It's an organ that sits round about here, just in front of the stomach. There it is. And within the pancreas are clusters of cells called the islets of Langerhans. Wonderful name. This is one of them. And these red cells are the cells that are going to make insulin. So we wanted to take these clusters of cells and put them in our device. So here again, we've got a slightly different design, but same thing, blood vessels. We've got our green blood running through the blood vessels. And you can just see the shadows of these islets of Langerhans in the device, so we've got them in there. Here's a better view, the red blood vessels, the green blood, and there's our islet nestling in there. It's being kept happy, it's getting nutrients through the blood. And then we gave it a, a meal. We gave it a boost of glucose. And we put the glucose in here, lo and behold, it starts making insulin. So these islets, <coughs> excuse me, are working the same way in our device as they do in the body. You give them high glucose, they make insulin. So that works, so we're pretty psyched about that as well. So, summarize what I've told you. We're doing body on chip technology. We're recreating human organs that have all of the characteristics, as much as we can, of the way those organs are in the body. They're complex three-dimensional tissues. They have their own vascular supply, so they get blood supply to them. We're hoping and we have evidence that this is going to improve how we screen for drugs, how we test drugs, and ultimately how we prescribe drugs to patients. And now what I consider to be the most important slide of any talk <coughs> is this one. 
Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I have not actually worked in the lab for many years at this point. Uh, but these are the people that have. And this is, as far as I can remember, all the people that have worked in my lab since I got here to UCI. These are postdocs, graduate students, and technicians. We've also had over 50 undergraduate researchers, so called 199 students, working in the lab. And I know many of them are here, and I'm going to embarrass them acutely because I would like them to stand up. I know you're here, my lab. Anyone who's worked in my lab, can you stand up? <laughs> Ashley, Monica, come on. Thank you, guys. Thank you. So those are the people that have done all this work. And I've been incredibly lucky in my time at UCI. I've had some quite extraordinarily smart, uh, hardworking people in my lab. And none of this could have happened uh, without them. So here's pictures of them over the years. Uh, here are the collaborators, people that I've worked with at UCI over the years, uh, the funding sources that I've had. Um, it's been a tremendous journey, um, and I thank all of them for that. I started with a quote from Groucho Marx, and I'm going to end with this. I want to live a long and healthy life, and I'm hoping that the technology that we have developed is going to help us all to live a long and healthy life. Thank you for your attention. I'd be happy to take questions. <laughs>